when we head towards 2024 and the current ruling party becomes more desperate for votes, maybe as it sees coalition governments, the potential there are forming, they might put more pressure pressure on the treasury and the treasury needs to be supported to ensure that they don't buckle to those populist demands. Why is the South African government so obsessed with redistributionist policies? The latest policy on the table is the basic income grant, but can South Africa afford it? Joining me to discuss is Chris Hutting, my colleague at the Center for Risk Analysis. So Chris, uh, this BIG proposal, do you think that it is workable? What is driving it? Well, David, in terms of practicality, I find it very difficult to see where South Africa could get the necessary funds to fund a basic income grant. If we're looking at raising 50 billion rand, which is a conservative estimate, you would, for example, need to raise VAT by 15 to 17%. And as we head towards 2024 and very hopefully fiercely contested general elections, I doubt the current administration wants to take on that risk of increasing the VAT by that much. There are other ways, of course, you can increase income tax and other forms of tax on higher income earners, but then you also risk driving them overseas. So you make it more difficult for them to invest and operate in South Africa, then they're going to try and find other locales where their money might earn them higher and better rewards. The South African economic context is already very difficult to operate in. So why increase those barriers on income generation and wealth generation? In terms of what might be driving the BIG, I do think it's an element of centralization and big government thinking in terms of we as the government should rightfully be the the biggest thing on which citizens depend uh, will give them everything that they might need and we don't mind how we go about funding that unfortunately for the government we're heading towards the tail end of the two-year running commodities boom commodities have been the biggest addition to the south african fiscus the tax revenues from that commodities boom so i don't foresee that the government will have that fiscal room that they've enjoyed for the last two years to fund something like a big and NHI, plans like that, et cetera. Um, I do think it's a very short-termist solution. It's very redistributionist, as you pointed out. It concentrates more power in the hands of the state. And I don't think it focuses on those solutions that the country needs to unlock real growth and individual independence and individual wealth creation. It's very zero-sum in a way. It's thinking the amount of wealth is fixed, so the government is best placed to redistribute it in the form of grants and the basic income grant in the future. I don't think it allows room for how do we change policies to enable South Africans to create wealth for themselves and their communities and their families. So South Africa pre-pandemic had a very extensive welfare system that was extended with the uh, relief, the special COVID relief grants. Uh, Those are due to come to a close in February. What do you think are the political drivers behind this? Is the ANC trying to curry favor with the electorate, particularly the poor, ahead of the 2024 elections? Have an eye on the ever-declining popularity? Maybe there's some pork barrel politics involved here. I don't think it can be denied in terms of practicality that grants in South Africa play an important role, given the country's history and that a lot of citizens still, unfortunately, are way below the poverty line. But that has been driven by ideology and the consequent downstream policies from the government. So restrictive labor laws, for example, affirmative action policies, BEE, everything that de- that depresses the potential for economic growth, business formation, job opportunities from being created, and again, inhibiting individuals from earning their own wealth. I do think a basic income grant appeals to a, a, an ever more desperate ANC to try and convince people to vote for it because it will continue caring for them. But I don't really see that as a life of agency and dignity uh, to think that, for example, the best that one can be afforded in life is a social relief grant or a basic income grant. I do think South African citizens deserve a lot better than that. And I do think they deserve policies which unlock the potential, at least, for wealth creation. There's no guarantee that with more freedom, everyone will be better off, but the possibilities and the potential thereof is much higher. You have much more capital moving around. You have people taking risks, trying to start small to medium businesses. And with those enterprises, they create opportunities to employ other people. And that also means higher tax revenue so that government can really focus on administering those grant programs, which really serve people who are indigent and who really can't take care of themselves. But you can't have the current trend that we do 
where you've got an ever high ever higher number of people dependent on grants versus a lower number of people in employment that is simply unsustainable both i think in terms of people agency and sense of owning their lives and also unsustainable in terms of the fiscus of the government being under too much pressure yeah and i think many of those people who are dependent on the state are in a way indirectly victims of state policy they've been locked out of the labor market by a highly restrictive labor regulatory framework which makes it very difficult for potential employers to hire them. What would a more growth oriented policy framework look like and how might that help to unlock uh, job creation and relieve poverty, Chris? Well, at the very least, getting some of the growth fundamentals and the low hanging fruit right, that would also, by the way, help uh, lessen inflationary pressures and things like rising food and fuel prices. So for example, getting uh, trade infrastructure in general right, getting the ports and the rail railways to function more efficiently, that means less freight on the roads, and that means fewer costs for businesses to move their goods and materials across the country, which in turn means lower prices of goods and foodstuffs and that kind of thing, which again allows people to spend their money differently. They don't have to just worry on, are they going to be able to put food on the table, but they'll maybe have more money to, to save and to spend on other things for themselves and their families. In terms of other reforms, uh, we're looking at things such as deregulating the fuel price, also competition in the electricity space. We had uh, notes from this from President Ramaphosa recently. We'll see if those reforms are actually implemented in a pro-market kind of way or whether they'll simply be afforded opportunities for BE and other affirmative action policies to continue downstream. As just one example, uh, we've got calls now for more renewable energy in, in energy competition. But unfortunately, South Africa only has two producers of solar panels. And if you still have local content requirements, those prices are going to continue to be high. So you need to open the market to imports and ensure that you don't just pursue localization all the time. And then finally, we need to strengthen property rights. That'll be one of the best ways to ensure that investment really flows into South Africa. As countries now try to weather a tight global environment, they're going to look at emerging markets where they get more bang for their buck. And they're going to look at countries that are serious about protecting investment. You aren't going to have long-term investment where expropriation without compensation is still on the table. So at the very least, removing that, I think, will send the right kind of signal to the world. And then finally, we need to not adopt things like a basic income grant or nationalizing the Reserve Bank, because then you indicate to both local and foreign investors that their money is simply up for grabs for whatever short-term populist policies might be uh, might be on the cards on a given day. That's not, I think, a serious way to afford South Africans that economic growth opportunity that they require. And do you think the National Treasury will be able to resist these populist pressures and reject or push back against the BIG as they've done in the past? I do think they will be able to. We have seen international rating agencies. Uh, they've felt confident in the way that Treasury has gone about writing South Africa's fiscal ship, as it were, and for Treasury to maintain that credibility and confidence it needs to continue on its current path. That doesn't mean it will solve all the country's problems, but at least it has now retained some of its weight, its international standing. When we head towards 2024 and the current ruling party becomes more desperate for votes, maybe as it sees coalition governments the potential there of forming, they might put more pressure pressure on the Treasury and the Treasury needs to be supported to ensure that they don't buckle to those populist demands. There is also the possibility for welfare reform. So maybe uh, not having a basic income grant, for example, but maybe moving other grants into one singular form. So at least then you streamline some of the administration and you ensure that you focus on really providing for those citizens, those indigent citizens who can't take care of themselves. But I think introducing another form of grant, another form of welfare, is the last thing South Africa needs. And at the moment, I really hope that Treasury sticks with how they've been going and don't buckle to that pressure. Chris Harting, thank you very much. Let's hand over to you, our audience. Do you think that a basic income grant would be sustainable in South Africa? Leave your thoughts down in the comments section below. Also, if you would like to read more about this topic, I'd encourage you to follow the link in the description below and in the pinned comment. That will take you to an article that Chris wrote for The Daily Friend on redistributionist policies in South Africa. My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.